Hello and welcome to the final programme in the series Collective Wisdoms. My name is Caroline Brennan. Now this is the series that features a different creative person each week who tells us why they decided to make a difference. Now this week I have made my way to the southeast of County Down to a wonderful isolated spot where I'm nestled between the Irish Sea and the Mourne Mountains. And if I concentrate very carefully, I actually can see the Isle of Man and the mountains of Cumbria in the distance. It's a beautiful place. But who lives here? Well, that's the question. Well, my guest this week is a writer, a painter, a philosopher, and indeed a poet. And his name? It's Anthony Weir. I would classify myself as a typical Irish eccentric, or perhaps English eccentric, or Anglo-Irish eccentric. I have elected to live on the outside of society financially, economically, and to look from the outside in and be rather glad that I'm not in. I chose this house about 25 years ago when I was looking for somewhere cheap to live. And... uh, I had never had any money in my life, uh, so I put an ad in a local paper asking for people who had ruins to let, and uh, I found this very nice house, which wasn't exactly a ruin, but had been rather badly treated by the previous tenants, so I moved in, and it was at that time five pounds a week, and uh, now, in fact, it's even cheaper. Unfortunately, I need a car. And I really don't approve of cars. I think the internal combustion engine was one of the greatest disasters of all time. But unfortunately, we're trapped into this uh, economic uh, and, I suppose, cultural cycle of, of having to be near, having to be able to get to places. Anthony grew up in West Belfast, And one of the most profound influences in his life has been his negative experience of the education system. I went to a sort of a a private school. My mother's crimped and saved because she had been persuaded that since I was fatherless, I should go to a a pay school, in in this case Campbell College in Belfast, uh, to get the corners knocked off me. Her big mistake of sending me to a private school was because she was enthralled to her extremely right-wing brother who had been in the Navy during the war and an extremely right-wing family doctor who thought I, who both thought I was a sissy and uh, should go to this school and be hardened up when in fact I was an artistic child, very interested in words, in literature. I was learning French at the age of four. I was o- uh, always interested in, in, in language and in nature, in flowers. I always learned the n- names of flowers. I started learning the names of lat- uh, Latin names of plants very early. But the ethos of the time was that boys had to go and learn, be rugby, do rugby and learn mathematics, which I loathed. And languages were just a, a kind of silly tack on uh, to the syllabus and literature was something uh, slightly airy-fairy and thought was something that uh, real men didn't do. Uh, wrapped over the knuckles for being left-handed and forced to write with my right hand, which means means it meant that I uh, learned very late. I mean, I still can't, don't, don't write very well, but I was a very bad writer. And nearly all my school memories tend to be of that sort of thing. Well, all it did was turn me into a a complete rebel and uh, to decide that I would never do what society expected of me. I would never have a job. I would never earn money uh, in the usual way. I didn't want money. The whole culture was seemed to me to be based on money and I didn't want to have anything to do with it. So sending me to a private school was uh, a disaster and a very expensive disaster for my mother because she had to pay, shell all this money out for an extremely bad education. <laughs> with very, very bad teaching uh, because I only became a real human being once I left school. Anthony's mother was a solid influence in his life. But what about his dad? I let him explain. I never missed a father. And I don't understand how anybody, how any children do. 
um, because my mother was quite, she was quite determined. She was in control of her own life. She was uh, a primary school teacher. She had that job. It was uh, uh, security. She lived with her sister, also unmarried, and up to 1953 with her mother. So I was brought up in a in a house of, of women, all of whom were quite strong, but not in any sense d- domineering, who didn't p- particularly feel that they were on the shelf or anything. Uh, I never had, a, had, had, had any kind of negative feeling in that sort of way. As I say, I, I, I never missed a father uh, until maybe about the age of eight when I, it slowly dawned on me that my family wasn't quite the same as other people's family, but I didn't even then feel a sense of loss. And I've never uh, missed a father, nor have I, mm, for more than about half an hour at a time, wondered about my father. I, in fact, didn't know that my mother was my mother until I was 40 because she had adopted me because being a school teacher and an unmarried mother in the 1950s, even in the North, which was relatively advanced socially, was an absolute no-no. She would have lost her job. And when she became pregnant, after her only sexual experience, I think, at a New Year's Eve party for uh, pilots and uh, um, other people connected with the Air Force in Belfast in 1940. I should say that Belfast was a rest place for Canadians, Americans and Poles during the war. Uh, this was re- regarded as a rather safe place to be. Uh, so there would have been quite a lot of people and I guess she got knocked up, as the expression is, at that party. Then rather late in the day discovered she was pregnant. All this I didn't discover till I was 40 and confronted her with it because I had previously confronted her with uh, my sort of change uh, in sexuality myself. I decided I was uh, more interested in men than women. And I had just uh, uh, told her that I uh, was homosexual. Well, not exactly homosexual because I like women very much and uh, I'm very interested in women's beauty. But... Uh, bearded hairy men are uh, people who attract me sexually which is not a very uh, good state to be in because uh, bearded hairy men tend to be extremely unreliable (laughs) whereas women tend to be rather more reliable. Anyway uh, the the trigger for this uh, mm, series of epiphanies for my mother and myself was that I had been in Paris and I had met a a very nice uh, Mexican-American guy in Paris and sort of fell in love. I mean, it was one of those fairly shallow love events. And I brought him back home and said, isn't this a nice chappy? I rather rather like him. And um, my mother actually liked him too, so that was fine. And shortly after that, um, she decided to tell me that uh, she was actually my mother. Anyway, she had to wangle a trip to England during the war because you needed a passport and special papers to get to England from Ireland, from even Northern Ireland during the war. So she managed to get uh, a doctor's certificate saying that she had some rare disease to go to England. And then she went to uh, a kind of, I suppose, half baby farm, half workhouse in Berkshire uh, and eventually had me and... I had intended to have me adopted, but then couldn't get rid of me. Uh, uh, decided she couldn't part with me, I should say, and uh, left me at the baby farm. Joined the Women's Auxiliary Air Force so that she could be in England, near to me, and uh, saw me, I assume, at various intervals during that year. Then, once I was adopted, brought me back to Belfast, where I was looked after by my grandmother and my aunt uh, while she continued enjoying herself during the war, which she did. She sounds like such, number one, a determined, such a determined person, but also somebody who had something in sight and was going to achieve it no matter what. I mean, I'm trying to think at the amount of planning that must have gone on in her head so that she could have her little boy home. Yes, this was a remarkable thing, uh, but it was also... Uh, her family. Uh, she had told nobody except in the family except her own mother. And her own mother had been a midwife. 
and she has been a country midwife, and she knew, the mother knew, my grandmother knew, of all sorts of terrible things that happened, of babies being stifled in backstreet abortions, or other cottage abortions, and all sorts of horrible things that were going on quite regularly throughout the whole island of Ireland at that time. And she uh, backed my mother and said, right, if you're going to have this baby, we'll do the best we can. And uh, so they both had grit, I would say. They weren't, as I said uh, before, they're, they're not domineering, but they, they just quietly did what they felt they had to do. And this, I think, I've inherited, because I've inherited a hell of a lot from my mother. This is radio, but um, it is quite remarkable that until the age of 40, I didn't know that my mother was my mother, because I could, I can actually still wear her clothes. I have very narrow shoulders, and I have spade-like thumbs, spatulate thumbs. And only the only t people I've ever known to have these thumbs are my mother and me. And I was really thrilled. I thought it was brilliant that, uh, that there we were actually related. And then I thought, well, I'm a, really a twit not to have twigged onto this much earlier. Anthony says he is a thinker with a capital T. So as a thinker that he is, how does he view himself as an individual looking from the outside in? That's the question I put to him. All I see is a being of no more importance than any other being like a tree or a cockroach or a retrovirus. I certainly don't see a soul inside me. There is will, uh, which Nietzsche wrote about a great deal, and uh, that that will is consciousness, or consciousness contains the will. So if I look inside myself, I see consciousness, which is abstract, and I'm sitting on top of that consciousness is uh, my rational brain. And underneath the rational brain are, are things like dreams and uh, unconscious stuff. Dreams are kind of detritus, very, very largely. And then there's memories and all sorts of other things that uh, uh, are in the porridge of subconsciousness. A little while ago you mentioned about memories and that you didn't actually think they were good things. Memories are not good things. Explain that. I think that memories are, are fine so long as you don't think they're important. Uh, I remember very little of my life because I've, I tend to live in the moment. And people who think a lot about memory uh, tend to live in the past. They, they suffer from nostalgia, which the Greeks regarded as a serious disease. I think that Memory can, as uh, Haruki Murakami said in his wonderful no novel Kafka on the shore, he says, memories can warm you up from inside, but they will also destroy you. In other words, they can destroy your uh, integrity because you're going back to a past which is no longer you because the past is past. Amongst many of his extreme views, Anthony Weir holds a strong opinion on procreation. I asked him to explain what he believes in and also to explain and help us understand how he came to have the strong opinions that he holds when it comes to this particular issue. I have recently come to think of, think of myself as a failed abortion because my mother tried three times uh, to get rid of me in the womb, once by knitting needles, once by gin and running and falling downstairs, and the third time by swimming out to sea and so that she would drown, except she was a very good swimmer and then just simply swam back. So I reg regard myself as this failed abortion, and this is not a negative thought. It is a completely neutral thought, and it's quite a nice way of thinking. But my op opinions on procreation came, I suppose, in late adolescence, and at an early age, I got a vasectomy so that I could not procreate. And this was when I was going to Africa to live with pygmies, and I thought that it would be an extremely bad idea if uh, I managed to inseminate some uh, a pygmy or uh, other kind of African person. I think that creating another human being who, who is extremely likely, like 90% likely, to be fairly miserable most of, the, most of his or her life, I think that is a crime against us, 
as individuals and it's certainly a crime against nature considering the damage that's been done to the planet. And recycling your rubbish will do absolutely nothing for the planet, but not having another child or not having any children at all will be a much better thing because we are consuming and we create consumers and that is all the procreation is. It is creating consumers for the consumer society. Do you regret then being born? Yes. Uh, I think any human being is better not being, <laughs> quite simply. Uh, all right, I'm born, that's why I'm making the best of things. Uh, and given my opinions, I am trying to live as authentic a life as possible, uh, having as little to do with the consumer society and the trashing of the planet uh, that I can, although obviously I'm deeply implicated in, in that process. I, th I think it's quite impossible to to live uh, with any equanimity in a world knowing that you are a member of the species who is going to wipe out the planet as we know it and probably going to wipe it out quite soon. And we, by setting ourselves outside nature, are just uh, wrecking the planet. And it's not so much wrecking the planet in abstract as causing unbelievable misery. Ten million animals a, uh, a day slaughtered in, in Europe just so that, that, that people can have uh, rather tasteless uh, uh, chops and steak and minced meat. I decided very early on that I was going to be outside society and live at the bottom of the heap because that's the best way to be outside. To be underneath is to be outside in a sense because you, you get a worm's eye view. And being in the bottom of the heap, living on social welfare and uh, occasionally having to trot into an office to explain yourself. This has given me uh, freedom to write the, the various books of poetry that I've written and to paint and to think and uh, to try and do my best to be an authentic person and in a sense to contribute not just to the society but to thought with a capital T by expressing ideas which people will find uh, offensive or shocking or very, very surprising, like my ideas on procreation. Uh, and I think that Western society is uh, particularly totalitarian in uh, marginalizing people who think. And uh, Diogenes, perhaps the greatest of all philosophers, uh, n n not a word of whose um, teachings survives, but uh, who taught that society was just uh, a, a kind of r refuse heap of greed and and power struggles, uh, and that the, the only thing to do was to distance yourself from it and uh, live your own life according to your own talents and propensities. So let's let's just get into into the imagination zone for just for a second. Anthony is now going to set up um, a new world, right? You have made it very clear in regards to your views on the current world system as it exists. So you are now going to set up something completely different or something new. What would you put in place? I, I can't answer that question, but what I would say is that as a model for life, we should simply look at, at other social animals. And very good animals to look at are chimpanzees uh, and wolves, who have very efficient and successful social orders and social systems which are consensual very largely but which are also biological there are there's a lot been written recently about um, chimpanzees particularly the pygmy uh, chimpanzee or bonobo who have very lovely happy cheery lives um, eating um, vegetables and masturbating each other and kissing all the time and having w wonderful games and um, where the females uh, run uh, each society rather successfully. They are loosely matriarchal. Uh, wolves have a different society because they're more patriarchal, but uh, they are very, very uh, efficient systems 
and wolves uh, all get on extremely well with each other in a hierarchical way. So we w would uh, learn to form our own natural hierarchies, which must not be hierarchies of need or greed or power, but simply uh, hierarchies of efficiency. Whereas in any, where in any given situation, wh whoever was best at uh, solving the problem or doing what needs to be done is given that role. And in another situation, some other individual would be because we are intelligent and can choose. You do believe in the element of power? The power is there. I mean, there's the power of the tree to root and grow, and that has ousted uh, another little plant. So, so power is there. But what I would say is that we have the power of reason, and societies, and especially religions, devote a great deal of their energy in making sure that we do not use our reason. The whole in, in educational system is bent on hijacking our reason, so that we will follow orders and not question them. The religion does the same, especially uh, wor world religions such as Christianity and Islam, wh whereas, uh, for example, Hinduism uh, does not do this because with the multiplicity of gods it gives you choice and it, it, it allows you to uh, pick and mix, as it were. So I, I think that we should use our reason and intelligence, and this is what most people are frightened of. What happens to you when you feel overwhelmed and how do you cope with that? I, I don't feel overwhelmed except by other people. And I'm afraid that when, uh, in the past when I have been felt overwhelmed by social situations, I tend to freak out. Uh, so I uh, tend to lose self-control. So uh, I'm not, not very, very good at this. Uh, because I was uh, I tended to be uh, a seven-stone weakling at, at school, I have always try to avoid situations, although um, I am not at all unnoticeable because I, I dress differently from other people and I look differently and I've got a beard and all that sort of thing which makes me look different, but I, I, I feel that I'm not foisting myself on, on society. So what, what I, I tend to avoid confrontation. Uh, I, I think my problems as, as a child were uh, due to a very mild form of autism which of course wasn't diagnosed in those days. And I relate very, very much to uh, people with Asperger's and autism. I understand exactly how they feel in social situations. I, uh, and although I'm quite good or can be quite good socially, I, just, I know exactly what it takes to uh, play the extremely complicated game of tennis. I understand how difficult it is to fit into society and it is getting more and more difficult because we're living in a society which is driven now by uh, all sorts of processes which run from credit card number uh, remembering and uh, bank accounts and censuses and filling in forms and getting up at seven in the morning so that you can be at work at nine when half the world are not morning people and really should not be getting up till 11 o'clock and going into work at two and maybe working till 10 if they want to. Uh, we live in a society which is actually set to make people feel oppressed and confronted at almost every turn. And uh, all, all autists... Uh, get uh, this early on in life and in a sense are very lucky because they they immediately opt out at the first hurdle they collapse and in the old days they were shipped off into uh, asylums and so forth but now they are getting we hope uh, a sympathetic uh, treatment and can sidle into society eventually on their own terms which they weren't allowed to do before but normals in inverted commas in other words people who aren't picked up as having problems, although they may have severe problems, uh, aren't. And I would think that most people are, feel very uneasy in, in society and are just muddling through from day to day. And uh, they seek, particularly in northern countries, to drown their problems and anxieties in drink or to numb them by watching television. 
uh, or other strategies which do not involve thought when, in fact, the one thing that we have which is really good and really powerful is the power of thought and the power of reason. And the one thing that we are not taught in school is logic. There is a very good reason for this. Governments would hate us to think logically because we would get rid of them very quickly. I'm wondering, Anthony, as to whether do you ever feel very misunderstood? I don't feel misunderstood because I don't expect anyone to understand me. And I really don't expect to understand other people. Uh, I try to make sense of the world, but I don't expect to understand it in a, you know, in a capital U. Uh, the world is completely mysterious and people's motives. I can understand their motives, but I can't understand why they are driven by the corrupt forces which derive people. I'm going to just finish up w- with the question of what's next for Anthony Weir? Well, I'm 65 now and I don't feel very much different from when I was about 18, 19. I feel considerably wiser with a rather small W there (laughs) Um, and sadder but life for me continues to be a strange kind of adventure I have a small group of friends who I like to be with from time to time. I live on my own and can do what I like to do most, which is think (laughs) Uh, a great deal of the time. For, For me, being is thinking and being is going to bed. And I love doing things like going to bed and I love eating and I love cooking and I love drinking wine and I have no complaints that I know of although I may seem to have a very negative philosophy which I would call realistic uh, I'm actually quite a a happy cheery person I look forward to getting older and I really look forward to dying because that will be the consummation of my little life on this poor sad, abused planet. This series is kindly made with the support of Sound and Vision, which is a broadcasting funding scheme initiated by the Broadcasting Commission of Ireland.